Okay, thank you, Mike, and uh, welcome everyone to our uh, monthly insight uh, meeting. We call it our member meeting, but anyone's welcome. Uh, my name is Stephen Miller. I'm a co-PI for Insight and the Director of Cybersecurity Center of Excellence for Eastern New Mexico University uh, in Rio Dosa, a branch community college. And uh, today uh, we're going to have our panel on AI's impact on cybersecurity in instruction and work roles. And our uh, panel moderator will be Dr. Uh, Casas Torregas. Uh, he's the director of the Cybersecurity and Privacy Research Institute at George Washington University. And our panel members will be Dr. Iman Al Sheikh. From she's the associate vice president for the Center of, for Cybersecurity at the University of Western Florida, and uh, AI, machine learning, and uh, cybersecurity expert and leader. Uh, we'll have Michael uh, Prebell, who is the uh, Cybersecurity Workforce Analyst at NIST NICE, and uh, Dr. Uh, Vincent uh, Nessler, who is Associate Professor at Cal State uh, University San Bernardino and a Senior Personnel uh, in, for the Insight Center. And I'm going to turn this over to uh, Costas. Uh, thanks, Stephen, uh, and welcome, uh, everybody. I see we've got over 100 people on the call. And my guess is it's going to keep on rising um, for obvious reasons. Everybody wants to know about AI. It's the politically correct thing to do. Uh, most of the deans, most of the university presidents say we got to get on this AI stuff in industry. We got to offer services that are all AI enabled in government. We got to be prepared for AI. We got to have dominance AI. So this event is to slow things down just a little bit and to approach AI from the educators perspective and most of you here on the call are educators we took a, a count uh, at last count there were over a hundred universities over a hundred community colleges uh, and then about 20 or so government officials 20 or so industry officials uh, at almost 10 from the K through 12 arena uh, and uh, about 10 for the nonprofit sector so we have a good mix to slow things down and talk about our own individual uh, concerns, our fears, and we'll hear from you, the audience. Uh, please start putting questions in the chat so we can all uh, benefit from it. Uh, I won't say very much. I'll try to moderate the discussion, but I do want to say one thing, and that is that I was given the privilege a month ago to testify in front of the uh, House uh, Committee on uh, Government Innovation and Cybersecurity. And the, the topic was, how do we develop an AI-ready workforce? Pretty much uh, on target with what, we're, what attract us here today. And the one thing that I try to emphasize is that we need to start talking across boundaries. We need to have government and industry, and at the same time, the education community, together in the same room. Educators get together, government gets together, industry gets together, and talks about how to proceed. But having all three of them together, like we have this morning, is unique. So I celebrate Insight's ability to bring together those three uh, uh, sectors. And I'm going to put the, uh, uh, the uh, discussion from um, the House Committee, uh, test, uh, where three individuals uh, testified, two academics and one industry, uh, for those of you that want to see what Congress is beginning to think about AI-ready workforce. Uh, with that as an introduction, uh, I'm going to tell you that we'll, we'll, we'll use the following flow. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Nestler, uh, better known as Vinny, uh, to many of us, uh, to start talking about, to, to kind of lay the lay of the land of what is AI in the classroom, what is his perspectives, what does he see in reality with the tools that he uses, with the students that he faces uh, every day. We just, some of us heard that he's got a three- three-hour event just in a couple of hours from now, again, going deeply into AI uh, strategies. Then I'm going to shift over to Michael Preble from this NICE, because NICE is the place where the government is trying to say, here are some frameworks to approach things. And guess what? They've got AI in their sites as well. So it's a perfect opportunity to hear from NICE and at the same time intervene and ask your questions. And then we'll end up with Iman El Sheikh. Uh, Iman is in a powerhouse uh, university in Southern Florida, and one of the things that she does very well is she really 
uh, listens to the academic concerns, listens to faculty concerns, and empowers them to move forward. So she'll bring us more of the faculty perspective uh, on this. So that's the arrangement that we have uh, for an hour's uh, worth of conversation. And I'm going to try to keep us on track and uh, on time as a moderator. Uh, with that as an introduction, I I'm not sure when we're going to show the, the, the poll results, um, just to give us an idea. But Vinny, it's up to you. We want to see the poll. <laughs> yep. There we go. Vinny, there's the poll for you. I don't see it. Where'd it go? Uh oh. 98%. Stop I'm sharing. Vinny, stop sharing and you'll see it. Probably. All right. Oh. 98%. Okay. Never daily, weekly, monthly. Well, number right. one is telling, isn't it? <laughs> All Exciting. Right. Take it off. All right. So it's just one slide, actually two, depending. Uh, so <clears throat> the gen, gen, so we're in the generative AI era, right? Um, and AI has been threatening to take over for decades, right? Gary Kasparov is the last man standing against Deep Blue. 1997, he loses the chess match. By the way, a very good DEF CON talk. I highly recommend you listen to his perception of going up against AI, you know, all of his human faculties against the, the AI and, and, and what his experience was. It's very good. But after that, nothing happened. I mean, you know, AI was there and there, there are things that are going on, but there was no real threat to anyone uh, of a significant nature. And then in 2017, the seminal paper, Attention is All You Need, and if you haven't read it, please do, talked about transformer technology, backpropagation and all that. And that is really what created generative pre-trained transformer technology, GPTs, as we know it. Um, and... And now, now they're everywhere. And the horse has left the barn. And on horses, when the car was created, people said, you know what? Uh, more better technology makes more better jobs for people, which is true. The people who used to work on horses, they moved on to work in the factories, making more money. But it didn't make more better jobs for horses. <laughs> I can't give a horse away now. And so AI is the car displaced, disrupted humans in what the work they were doing, but it replaced the work that horses were doing. AI is not just disruptive, it's replacing. So the question is, if, if AI can do anything better, faster, safer, or cheaper, if it can do any four of those things, not impacting the other three, and usually it's doing all of them, companies have a fiduciary responsibility to use that technology. And if they don't, somebody else will, and they'll become less competitive. And where AI is going, if you take a look at the website, there's an AI for that. There's an actual website. There's an AI for that. It'll show you there's something like 12,000 tasks that AI is doing. If you look at the tasks in cybersecurity and IT, about 83% can either be assisted or replaced by AI. NVIDIA, third largest company right now, closing in fast on the second most uh, profitable company, said, the CEO said just a week ago, don't go into computer science. It's not worth it. Don't, it's not, there's nothing, don't do it. Stability AI, that CEO said, no programmers in five years, right? Now, these are two people who, uh, probably should know the industry. And that's what they're saying out loud to the public. AI is merging with robots. Uh, AI-powered robots has labor and capital as the same thing now, right? So now I could buy a robot, robots to labor. Where does labor as a human have any competitive edge? I buy a robot, I got the labor. AI, generative AI, as the large language models get more utility, I could use it to do more things. It goes down in value because everybody has access to it. So what does that do to our to to how you the economy of things? So how all of these conditions play out 
and how should we adjust as professors? You know how we, you know, what, how are we preparing our students for the future, based on the current landscape? And is it possible that AI is just going to go by the way of like uh, Y two K, Dogecoin to the moon? That didn't happen. Uh, Bill Gates is said he said six forty K. Nobody needs more than that. <laughs> and who needs a computer in their home? With that, I yield back my time to the right honorable gentleman, uh, Costas Tarragas. Very good. Vinny, I think you got us off on a good start. I think you probably stroked up and stroked down a few egos in the process. And so it's a definition of a great introductory uh, uh, set of remarks. I'm not going to go over to Mike. And Mike, um, NIST has been, NIST NICE has been uh, constantly kind of scanning the, the, the landscape. You've been upgrading and changing the framework for cybersecurity, uh, work roles, and so on and so forth. And you're now hearing these knocking on the door. What do we do about AI? So maybe give us a little bit of a perspective from NICE's things and also tell us how we can help you. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Costas. Um, Vinny, you're a hard act to follow. Iman is a, a hard act to proceed. I'll do my best. Um, Mike Preble, as uh, as Mike Singletary mentioned, I'm a cybersecurity workforce analyst at the National Institute of Standards Technology. I primarily work on the workforce framework for cybersecurity, the NICE framework, which provides a common language for uh, describing cybersecurity work. I do some technical work maintaining and upgrading the workforce framework. I also do stakeholder engagement work. So uh, I and my uh, manager, Karen Wetzel, convene experts try to understand how the workforce framework needs to evolve to respond to changes in work and technology, of course. We're thinking uh, tons about AI and how uh, we you know, safely and responsibly integrate AI technologies into work and workplaces. There are a lot of new developments to the NICE framework that will be coming um, as a result of those things, uh, certainly in collaboration with our colleagues at, in other parts of NIST and then across the federal government more broadly. Um, just to finish my introduction of myself, um, I'll also say I'm a student uh, and a career changer. And since the pandemic, I've seen sort of firsthand uh, how the student experience has changed basically all the way through the gamut from matriculation to instruction to assessment to career placement, um, especially through the impact of generative AI in the year that I've been in grad school. Um, so I'm excited to bring that perspective into the second half of our conversation today. For the first half, um, Costas, I'll do my best here, but it's a really tall order to uh, sort of categorize or uh, catalog everything that's happening in the uh, federal government in terms of AI work. I won't try. Um, if you're interested in sort of a broader look at the at federal investments and initiatives around AI, um, AI.gov is your place. There's an especially interesting page, I think, that's uh, focused on AI use cases for the federal government. You can see basically lists of current applications for of AI in about two dozen different departments and agencies. Really cool. For the purposes of this discussion, though, I'm going to focus on three things. So the NICE framework, how it's changed and how it's going to change to reflect uh, AI developments. Uh, second, work that's being led by my colleagues in other parts of NIST around AI. Uh, and then third, some non-NIST initiatives that I think are really, really important uh, for people in this community to be aware of. Uh, the first is the NICE framework. We've just published some really comprehensive updates uh, to the elements of the NICE framework. So that's updated work roles, updated task knowledge and skill statements, and new competency areas, uh, which includes one focused on AI security. Um, competency areas, a little more focused on assessment, uh, education, development. So kind of an interesting thing to talk about maybe more later. Um, the work is not done. It never ends. We expect to be conducting uh, minor releases of updated content in the NICE framework uh, on a roughly annual basis going forward. And of course, a lot of that is going to be influenced by uh, the trajectory of AI technologies uh, in cybersecurity. So for the AI security competency area uh, in particular, that's gonna mean a lot of subject matter expert engagement um, over the next few uh, months. We're actually getting started on that, uh, hopefully in the next uh, week, few weeks or so. Um, lucky for us, this is the second topic. We've got a ton of great subject matter expertise uh, on AI at NIST. Uh, one really important body of work that you may have encountered already is our AI risk management framework or the AI RMF. Um, this was congressionally mandated in 2021, started getting a lot more of its more attention, uh, first as a result of that sort of generative AI boom that uh, Vinny mentioned early in 2023, and then as a result uh, in October 2023, so last year, of the uh, executive order on safe, secure, and, and uh, trustworthy development and use of AI. Um, our trustworthy and responsible AI resource center is probably the place to go if you're interested in learning more about that side of the work. Um, you can also, uh, so that's the AI RMF. A lot of the related resources there. You can also check out some of the um, some more specific research if you're interested in like adversarial machine learning. There's a really great paper there um, from some of our researchers, some really interesting cybersecurity applications. Um, privacy, of course, is a big factor in AI. We have a privacy engineering program 
Um, it's going to be doing a lot of their a lot of work uh, in connection with the AI risk management framework. They're also completing their own uh, workforce framework that will be released for comment, I believe, next month or the month after. Um, throughout, sorry, that was a lot to, to throw at you with the, just with the NIST side of things. Throughout, we're trying to make connections between the NICE framework and all of these other bodies of work that are happening at NIST. That's a tall order, too. Um, but what we, the way that we do that is we really depend on the input of our government colleagues, but then also really crucially academics uh, and members of uh, private industry as well. Um, and there are a couple of ways that we do that. I won't get too, too deep into them now, but if you'd like, you can email niceframework at nist.gov um, and we can make all the connections that you possibly need. Last thing, just a couple of important projects outside of NIST that are really relevant to this discussion of uh, work role evolution and workforce training impacts of AI. The Defense Cybersecurity Workforce Framework is published by our colleagues at the Department of Defense. Uh, it's generally the same structure as the NICE framework, actually emerged from the NICE framework. Uh, the DCWF takes a slightly broader uh, perspective of the types of jobs or types of work roles that it looks at. So it includes some AI work roles, which are definitely worth having a look at if you're interested in learning more in this space. Two initiatives then, finally, from the National Science Foundation, NSF, that I would hold up. The first, Iman and Vinny can actually talk, uh, speak to you better than I can, since they're both regularly involved with it. The uh, Chips and Science Act of 2022 mandated that the NSF explore the need for and the feasibility of an AI scholarship for service. So uh, NSF is expected to issue a report uh, to fulfill that charge next month. Um, it's a collaborative effort. A lot of other agencies involved, NIST, DOD. Um, and one important and really, really interesting aspect of it is that there is a possibility of developing an AI workforce framework, which of course would be influenced by the NICE framework. Um, it would be, I think, quite transformational in this discussion that we're having today. Nothing that can be shared now, but just know that that's under discussion. Second AI, excuse me, uh, NSF initiative that's worth noting, this one also comes out of Chips and Science Act, the uh, Cybersecurity Workforce Data Initiative. You can't do good workforce development uh, without a, with a workforce that you can't fully describe. Um, and although we have great sources like CyberSeq to tell us uh, little bits about uh, the cybersecurity workforce, what jobs look like using web scraping, we don't currently have a cybersecurity specific national workforce survey. That's a possibility that's being explored by NSF right now. Um, they'd be using the NICE framework as a reference point, and certainly they'd be having an eye to uh, long-term tech-driven workforce changes, including through uh, AI. Those are my big things. Costas, I hope I did okay. So big changes to the NICE framework. Big work happening at NIST uh, around trustworthy and responsible use of AI, going to be informing our workforce efforts, and then some really exciting uh, initiatives from our colleagues at DOD, NSF, a ton of other federal agencies as well. That's great. No, you did you did very well. You forgot to say how we all can help you, and perhaps that's by tuning into the various discussions that uh, NIST uh, engages academia with, and we'll use the chat uh, a place to find uh, how we can attract and support uh, your efforts at the federal level. We need to do that because, in a sense, you you become our voice um, as we try to uh, figure our way through. And now um, I'm going to turn over to Iman. Uh, the, the challenge of helping us look from the from the educator side uh, more practically and, and how do we how do we find a path forward? I can tell you in my own university, the George Washington University, we've got a trustworthy AI center, we've got lots of people involved in AI, but it's very difficult to focus the attention because AI is so pervasive, it's all over the place. So the question is, how do you focus on it? How do you prepare younger faculty members for it? And so on. So Iman, I'm looking forward to your remarks uh, from, the, from the faculty side. So the floor is yours. Thanks, Costas, and thank you, Stephen and Michael and Insight for hosting this panel, all the great work that Insight does and my fellow panelists. Um, it's great to, now that we all hopefully know that AI is coming, I saw the results of the poll, 98%. Uh, we can talk about how, as higher education, we can adapt because we need to start adapting already. So I'm Iman al Sheikh. I'm Associate Vice President at the University of West Florida, lead the Center for Cybersecurity. And the quick intro about me is I'm a huge fan of AI. Um, I have about 30 years of experience in AI, machine learning, and cybersecurity. Uh, my PhD work was in AI. My first work in AI was about 1990, so I'm giving away my age on a Friday here. Um, I developed and taught undergrad and grad courses in AI at UWF. Um, and then we're also now offering uh, undergrad and grad courses in AI, machine learning for cybersecurity, applied AI, 
as well as a very niche PhD program in intelligence systems and robotics that's interdisciplinary of cybersecurity. So definitely a lot of cutting edge research uh, as well. Um, so back to, you know, how do we adapt? It's great that many of the participants are across universities and colleges across the country. Um, how do we adapt as higher education? And I would argue as an AI fan, and based on what you heard from Vinny and Mike, thank you for those comments and Costas, that we need to infuse AI into everything. Um, we're seeing that AI is transforming our world and our work roles. If you look at the studies, many of them are already showing use. Um, AI could replace 300 million jobs by 2030, so six years. Um, a, every company is using or will be using AI in the next five years, and I think those are all low estimates. So my solution or my advice in terms of preparing the next-gen workforce is to use an agile, layered, work role-based approach. What do I mean by that? Okay, agile, layered, work role-based. Agile, because we don't have time to develop majors and programs the traditional way, like we do with a stable discipline like economics, for example. AI is changing daily, daily, uh, what we're seeing. So we need to be very agile. Layered, let's look at it from the perspective of everyone needs to know something about AI, but it'll depend on for what reason or their work role. And so I'd say the outermost layer is all people need to be AI informed, right? Think about AI-informed superhumans, right, of, of the future. Um, uh, so everybody, young and, and, and old, across sectors, across borders, should understand AI evolution, what generative AI is doing right now, and the benefits and the risks of AI. And they should also learn about common AI tools, ChatGPT, Gemini, DALI 3 to create pictures, very simple things that could really help their daily lives. I'd say that's the outermost layers for all people. What about everybody in higher ed, all of our students that we cater to and love so much? I think we should focus on creating an AI first professional across the higher education landscape, right? So think about it as regardless of major, we need to be creating applied AI graduates from our colleges and universities. What does that mean? Leverage AI tools, prompt engineering to improve productivity. What if I told you AI could help you respond to all those emails, manage your projects, uh, manage communications, write reports, it's already doing all that. Every major across our higher ed system should be afforded the opportunity to learn about and leverage those skills. And then also learn about how, how AI can benefit their own domains, whether they're studying healthcare or business or finance, or manufacturing, or art, or graphic design, or of course, cybersecurity, or engineering, there are ways that AI can help them. And that's kind of what we're doing here with our applied AI course is opening it up to all majors across undergraduate and graduate levels. And then third, last but not least, for those of us focused on cybersecurity, I think we need to create, and that's kind of the innermost layer of my layered approach, is an AI-enabled cybersecurity professional. Right, so for cyber and related majors, think about for how do we leverage AI and machine learning for cybersecurity? That's for the IT, cybersecurity, those majors, right? How can they use tools uh, and develop tools to enhance cyber defense? For example, automating network monitoring, automating threat detection, incident response, all of those tasks are already being done and can be done better by AI tools? How do we use machine learning models to solve cyber problems like authentication? Um, those again are ways we can enhance our curricula. Um, and we also shouldn't forget about our computer science or software development majors as well. Those are related majors that are very important. How do we think about the security of AI, right? To build secure AI development frameworks as educators and industry and government leaders, we need your help too, so that they can be developing secure AI secu uh, code, right? Uh, from, the, from the trustworthy and security perspective that Costas mentioned. How do we adopt standards and testing methodologies 
to ensure that AI systems are safe, secure, and trustworthy. That's really where a lot of the focus and, of course, the executive order that Mike mentioned is as well and the congressional testimony. And I think Mike Singletary is going to be sharing some resources with you all, uh, hopefully at the end of this as well. So that's kind of the nutshell. Um, I'll kind of stop there since we're out of time and I'll sh maybe share a little more later. Back to you, Costas. This is a dream uh, for a facilitator, moderator, animator of a workshop like this. Uh, you're, you've all stayed within your time uh, constraints, so it's now time to begin A, uh, to encourage uh, our audience to start putting questions in the chat. Uh, I'm going to move the conversation along and start asking some questions to relate you, the three of you together. So my first question is, uh, supposing you had your president or provost knock on your door and say, you, you're pretty smart in cybersecurity, all those computer stuffs. We want to get up on AI. What are the two or three things I need to do? And I'll give you two scenarios. One is without any additional money, so you, you pay, I overpay you anyway. Uh, and secondly, if I give you a brand new uh, a tranche of money, buyouts, whatever it is <clears throat> that you want to establish our university, our community college, our high school is the best in AI preparation for young minds. What would you What would you say? Uh, and uh, it, it, jump in, whoever wants first. Well, I think we've had some of those conversations, right? I'm sure some of those on the call have had uh, some of those conversations, but I think going back to, and I actually had that conversation with our leadership where there's some of us who are very excited about what AI can possibly do, the things that I thought wouldn't happen in my lifetime happening, and and our leadership pointing out that there are others who not only have no clue what we're talking about, that are um, perhaps skeptical and concerned about AI uh, impacting their courses, their curricula, their students, ethics, bias, things like that. So I'd say kind of look at how we could do it in a way that's beneficial, where like, for example, a course, you know, how do we embed, for example, AI, just like we have cyber hygiene or, you know, cyber uh, essentials, um, how do we embed that AI essentials into every course or at least every major so that students have an opportunity to, to learn about it across the board? Great. Vinny, what about uh, um, uh, San Bernardino? What what's the the spirit and the mood like there? So I'm 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 gonna try to answer the question rather than be specific to to this, which is if if that was asked to me, this is what I think is the case. If the CEOs are saying you don't need computer science in five years, there's no more programs, right? Now, either that person is and just gone, right? Or he's, he knows something that we should take into. We don't want to sell tickets to a boat that's not going to sail. And so we have to think, all right, well, what are the jobs going to be in five years? If there's no programmers, where do those folks go? Or how are we going to start to interact with technology? And it's going to be, and this is something that, that was, um, you know, shift happens. This is, I don't know what's what's more than a shift. It's like, it's more than a shift. It's like a complete flipping upside down. But we have to start thinking, all right, how do we program by just talking to the computer to get it to do the things that it needs to do, right? Or we, we have to actually look at what are the new jobs that are going to happen. New jobs are going to emerge. But will the new jobs that emerge <clears throat> equal the number of jobs that will be lost to AI? So to answer your question, the, before I could say how to transform the curriculum, I'd have to say, okay, well, what if these jobs are going poof, what are the new jobs that are emerging and are those the jobs I can go after? And if I, and the only way to do that is to project forward. You can't think about how things are right now. So for example, people are like, oh, AI is pretty good, but it's not that good. It's like, wait, just wait, give it another year, another two years. And it's doing stuff that we can't even imagine. So, so that's that's my kind of roundabout answer to it. Thanks, Vinny. And I see Alfredo has his hand up, but let me finish the the round of our speakers uh, by asking uh, Mike. And you might want to take the hat of a student as well. So go for it, Mike. 
I think I will. And Alfredo, I'll try to be quick. Um, I, so clearly I don't have a provost, uh, you know, I don't have, I don't work for a provost, so I would never be asked this question, but if, you know, if I were able to tell a teacher who were asked this pro uh, one of my instructors who were asked this by a provost, what I would say would be, um, just figure, you know, actually turn it back to the provost and say, give us some guidance. This is, uh, I think, partly to Vinny's point, give us some guidance about what our students can do to diversify the skills that they're acquiring in the course of their degree program. So, it, you know, I'm a math and statistics student. Does it make more sense for me maybe to be taking an, a graduate student in math and statistics? Does it make more sense perhaps for me to be taking an undergraduate course that's available in data mining uh, then it does for me to be taking taking general linear models too, and that very well may be that may be for me the best sort of the best way to to prepare myself for what's coming next, and to you know to get my degree aligned with what I want to do uh, in my professional life. And so I think getting uh, clear guidance from provosts from academic leadership about what flexibilities learners have in terms of designing degree programs that work for them, that work for their envisioned or possible futures in an AI enabled work environment. I think that's one of the things I would recommend. And just real quick, tacking on back to the question uh, Costa says, I think that's perfect, Mike, because it's more about kind of the response would be about kind of enabling the higher level skills. You know, how do we teach the higher level skills? The developers are still going to be needed. I heard what, uh, you know, the CEO of NVIDIA said, but of course he's pushing out the hardware. So he's advocating for that. We still need the developers to develop the newest AI technology that we're not yet aware of. All these tools that are coming out every day but it's developing the, the, the higher level skills that they need in order to do that kind of development safely and securely. Great. Uh, uh, Alfredo, are you still uh, there? I don't see your, your hand up anymore. Did you hear an answer to your question? Uh, can you hear me now? We Hello. can hear you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. It's really here uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, I did have experience myself uh, in having a meeting with the president to have an AI and data science program. And the reason that he called me to his office was because I wrote to him uh, from October last year, I was sending him every way we need to build the future, we need to do the, a curriculum on AI and data science. So he called me to the office. He said, okay, I give you all the support to do a, a master in AI. So I say, it's okay. I didn't ask for money, but I did ask for somebody uh, that was going to help me to support the guy. So I asked only $3,000. That's it, uh, off the record previously. So I, 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 I did that by myself. So I went, I went to his office and I did and, and I was thinking about a uh, master in computer in, in AI. And after two weeks, I realized I didn't consult with many people that probably Puerto Rico in many places in the US, they are not ready to have a master specifically in AI. So I went and I back to him, it's too, too specific. Maybe we need to grow down with computer science, computer engineering, and other, other areas. So I went to his office, I said, look, instead of doing a master in AI, I'm going to do you a certificate in AI in data analytics. A graduate certificate, I took the proposal last night. Six courses, I'm not going to tell the courses because I, I, I want to keep that in suspense. And, in the in the in I offer an area of interest in AI and machine learning. I understand that machine learning is a subset of AI, but somehow machine learning is that is, is something that everybody talk about. And and I had the curriculum design. This course on new under the computer science. One of these courses or the courses. It had the, uh, the course of ethics in, in AI, very important. AI, deep learning, machine learning, and I had a very good course that was recommended by Eman today. It's already, I had the curriculum ready in, in syllabus. It's called Machine Learning and Cybersecurity. 
So this is, I did have the experience. I'm working for the area of interest in AI machine learning, and that will be ready before July of this year. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. And maybe I can generalize it and ask our panelists to address this question of degrees, certificates, kind of targeted small uh, recognition in small areas uh, versus bigger areas and degrees themselves. And if I can throw in one last hand grenade in there, uh, what about the school of law? What about the business school? What about um, international affairs? What about medic medical school? They're all concerned. They all have faculty members and students that are hearing the drumbeat. How do, how do they work with you in the cybersecurity space that you've now been in comfortably for 10, 20 years and understand? What can they look to you for? Can you help them directly? So I've kind of mishmashed both the degree versus certificate route and then computer science, cybersecurity versus AI in other disciplines. Um, that's a mishmash, but who would like to? So I so I would I would say. So people are starting to say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do an AI certificate, AI program, major. My, that would be like majoring in word processing, right? Everybody has to do it. Nobody's majoring in word processing. The 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 far-reaching application utility and pervasiveness, ubiquitousness of AI is such that it's not something that you just, let me just study this. It's are gonna be already expected that everybody uses it for everything. The, I, I, it's hard for me to think of any business, even a bodega, that's not gonna have some value out of using an AI. So I think we have to kind of shift this. This isn't like, oh, cloud computing, next big thing, let's go do a certificate program in cloud computing. Not everybody's using cloud computing. Everybody will use AI and if they don't, it's to their detriment. So I think I think we kind of have to shift that thinking like, oh, here's a new thing. Let's make a certificate around it. I think it has to be more pervasive, like, OK, how does everybody stop what they're doing? Look at all the things that they're teaching. <clears throat> look at all the tasks for the work roles that you train people to work or educate people to do. Look at them and say, well, which of these can be replaced by AI? Which of these can be assisted by AI? And which of these can only be done by humans? And then start to maximize, okay, the stuff that only can be done by humans, let's make sure you learn that stuff first because that's going to keep you marketable. Then the ones that you can be assisted with AI, let's make sure you know how to do that. And the stuff that AI can replace, it's nice to know, but you you know, don't waste don't waste time on those tasks at the expense of getting the other two tasks done first. That's that's a great insight. Ayad, I see your hand up. Let me go to Iman first to see if we can complete the cycle and then we'll come to you. Iman. Thanks. Um, and following up on that, thanks, Costas. Like I, I think to your to the question, we need to think about three different aspects. So the applied AI, like what Vinny's talking about. Like, and I think that that, like back to the earlier question, we actually worked with the provost office to develop an applied AI course open to all majors, undergraduate and graduate levels, where it's like based on what they're learning, they can do specific projects or readings related to how to use the general tools, benefits and risks, but also how to apply AI to their particular field. Number two, though, I think we need more specific AI programs and certificates because we got here through the development and advancement of neural networks, deep neural networks, you know, language models. There's been years of research and development that has gone on in order to get to where we are. And we still need to keep pushing our boundary as, as humankind. And so we need the more specific programs. And that's why, you know, a few years ago, we launched a PhD program that is very kind of cutting edge niche, very small niche research area. So I think we need the, that. But third and last but not least, very dear to my heart, we need upskilling and reskilling. And that's something that at UWF and through partners on this call, Stephen Miller and, and various others, we have launched workforce development programs in cybersecurity and are now working to expand those to AI and cybersecurity 
because everybody, regardless of what role they're already in or what career they're pursuing, is going to need to to move on to really kind of benefit from this transformative moment, learn about how to leverage AI. So we need to think about how do we build upskilling and reskilling programs so that those who are already on their journey or in their work role can then now tap into the potential that AI provides for them. Excellent points. And I hope everybody's taking notes as I am because we're, we're, it's a complex topic. Before going to Ayad, uh, Mike, did you want to come in? Just, just really quickly, Ayad, I'll try to be quick here. Um, and I want to tie in um, just with something that Iman just mentioned about, about upskilling. And then I think circling back a little bit to Costas, one of the comments that you, Costas, to your testimony at the Oversight and Accountability Committee in January. And then also to, uh, I think, a comment that you made earlier at the, in, you know, to sort of kick off the discussion. Um, you know, I come at this work from, uh, you know, from sort of a background uh, really focused on alternative pathways. So really anything apart from the traditional residential four-year college degree, of course, the NICE framework is used for four-year college programs as well. But we're always thinking about alternative pathways, too, in the, the work that we do. Um, I think when we're considering how we build in, how we, you know, develop a next generation workforce around AI, how we improve uh, learning pathways and how we refine work roles, around AI, it's really, really important to get, to bring in those sort of non-degree pathways as well, um, alongside our degree considerations. And the remark I'd just make briefly is that, you know, we don't, I, we're starting to see, I think the, the emergence of an environment of credentials and curricula for AI, but we really don't see that rich an environment just yet. Certainly not as rich and as diverse as it is in cybersecurity. That's our issue now that we don't have that much in the way of, uh, of you know, sort of consistent certificate industry certifications or uh, academic curricula to to build off of in AI, and that's I think the problem that we're we're dealing with. We're sort of focusing on right at the moment. It's not going to be our problem for the long term. I think what we should anticipate is that we're going to have uh, a proliferation of those certifications and those curricula in a relatively short time frame. And so, what we should anticipate. So, we should anticipate that. We should also think about how we can be proactive. To Costas's point at the beginning of the call, um, at, the, at the beginning of the meeting, working across silos between industry, academia, and government to make sure that we are as much as possible on the same page about what quality looks like inside those certifications. Sorry, those credentials generally. So, degrees, certificates, industry certifications, apprenticeships, work-based learning. Um, and also within curricula generally. Um, so I think that's that's the point I would really make. We're at a place right now of, of sort of famine, not famine, but a relative scarcity of AI credentials and curricula. We're not going to be in that place for very long. Yeah. Thank you, Mike, for that. And of course, we have constant questions pouring in. And I want to remind people that uh, you can actually copy the chat before the, this uh, uh, call, the Zoom call is closed. Uh, so, so you can get the richness of all the URLs that people are posting, and please keep posting them. And I can promise you that Insight will take a good look at everything that's been said and try to play it back in meaningful ways, other than, you know, over and above simply replaying this. Uh, uh, Yad, uh, uh, please come in. Uh, sorry to have you waiting for so long. Oh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. So as an associate professor of computer science and cybersecurity, uh, my colleagues and I, uh, we're and still thinking about the future of computer science and the degrees that we are offering at our institution. <clears throat> so I heard a lot about that the computer science will not be needed in the near future. So um, our thinking like right now, maybe the, the traditional way of computer science may not exist within the near future or maybe the long-term future, we don't know yet. So even if we don't have the traditional programmers, still we will need the developers who will be able to develop the new models of AI. And because these models, I think may be the, will be the most needed in the future. So my, my, my I have two questions. The first question is about what, what are the, the advices that you can give us to the computer science and software engineering professors to work with the challenges or the future of AI, this is the first part. The second part, or the second question is, it's not only related to computer science, but all the degrees. Uh, students now, they are using the um, AI models like ChatGPT to, um, I don't want to, to say to cheat, but to help them in a degree to complete their assignments or projects or tasks 
So uh, how you can um, advise us to achieve the academic integrity if students are using <laughs> these tools to, to complete the tasks for them? And thank you. Thank you. Who would like to offer some, some advice uh, for our Yad? Um, I, I'd be happy to chip in briefly. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. Thank you for sharing that. And I, yet I didn't catch what institution you were at, but it's great that you're already thinking about it. I agree. I don't think computer science is going away. I think we're still going to need the developers. We're going to need the computer engineers. Look at the advances we've made in hardware to make this, um, you know, this uh, current state happen as well. So I think my advice would be to start like you're saying, A, uh, leveraging how you can develop, enhance your curricula to leverage AI, you know, the current status of AI to enhance software development and software engineering and security. So for example, uh, integrating tools like um, GitHub Copilot, right? Where, you know, first have them let, to compare their own code to Copilot as an example and see, you know, then have them, you know, let, use Copilot to develop code then in some advanced courses, you, we can have them develop such tools. How can they develop their own AI-based development or software verification and validation tools? Those are the skills that you're talking about, Ayed, I think, that are going to be needed in the future. Using you know, AI for software development and computer science, and then developing those tools of the future as well, as opposed to you know, developing linked lists or data structures, we can probably pull that off of chat GPT right now. So my thoughts. Um, let me let me let me give let me give the uh corollary to that. Uh it's the exact opposite. You won't need developers because I'm gonna be able to tell Chat GPT, not Chat GPT, the development program, I want a video game where it's the cast of South Park fighting with bazookas against the cast of Family Guy. And it will create it much like Sora they just showed they just gave it a prompt and it created an entire world and a, a realistic video right so they're moving to the point where you won't have to buy a game you could tell the game what you want and it will create it for you in real time and then you can experience it so now that they're gonna, you're going to be able to develop games for a audience of one so <clears throat> That's the direction the AI is going. And that's why somebody like NVIDIA, who, yes, they make the GPUs, but for them to say, don't go into computer science is the height of folly if he's wrong, because the person who would create the next new Call of Duty game where the millions of people are playing, he just scared them away from, from not going into the field to create the game that will make people want to buy his GPU. So... It, it's not a small matter that this person said that and said it on a world stage. And so, so the question is, are, and I mean this, and I don't say this with, I hope I'm wrong. I hope somebody, people are laughing at me in five years. Are we selling tickets to get on a boat that ain't going to sail? That's really the question we have to give some thought to. Um, I see it's already 1253. Ramira, you have your hand up. We do have some ending kind of closing remarks from the panel. So can you make your question short if you can? Okay, just had to navigate uh, the mute monster real quick. Thank you very much for your patience. Um, so uh, the question that uh, I want to pose really quick, and I'm sorry, I know we have closing remarks, but I think um, especially some of the last commentary was really, really important. Um, have we all paid attention to what happened to the last writer's strike? And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because generative AI and uh, what I'm calling and categorizing a disruptive technology, right, or innovation has kind of started this, this catalyst of, hey, Am I going to be replaced or as we used, you know, the, the South Park joke, uh, they're, they're taking our jobs, you know. Um, so I think we should take this very, very seriously, whether or not it's something to stay or to, to leave the uh, NVIDIA, um, uh, you know, um, CEO's comments. 
Um, of course, they are very, uh, you know, uh, marketing driven, but however, I think they are serious. And I wanted to know if this panel has already uh, started to see any of those types of very, very uh, huge disruptions that we saw occur during the writer's strike because that really was about a generative AI situation, replacing writers from a contractual uh, element. Thank you, Ramira. So we have five minutes and I'd like to give a minute each to uh, our excellent panelists. Uh, perhaps you can reflect on that human component that Ramira is reminding us of uh, and perhaps give us some uh, ending remarks. So Iman, why don't you go first? Sure, thanks again. Uh, and this has been a great discussion. I wish we had all day, uh, but no, we're educators. We can talk all day. We shouldn't be doing that. So I think in a nutshell, you know, I just encourage everyone to, you know, you know, jump on the bandwagon, but do it responsibly. I mean, right now, if you look, there's a lot of emphasis across the federal government, across, you know, the globe. Look at what EU is doing as well on AI policy to you know leverage AI, but with the 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 power comes kind of the the risks and the responsibility. And so there's also a lot of emphasis on trustworthiness, security, safety of AI. So think about, you know, get together with your colleagues and your partners and think about what makes sense as a starting point. How can you use it as a, you know, let, develop a phased approach. And I would say, you know, at the end of the day, the most success we have had with AI across all the years, you know, dating back to, you know, the 1940s has been kind of the, the human, the shared human, you know, AI, uh, you know, uh, agents, uh, you know, where, where it's collaborative, where it's, you know, collaborative action, collaborative decision making. And so I think we're still going to need the human creativity, uh, as people pointed out. To, to develop the next Anthropic and OpenAI and NVIDIAs of the world. Um, and, you know, it's up to us as higher educators to kind of lead that charge for um, transforming knowledge and skills in future generations. Thank you, Iman. Uh, Vinny, why don't you wrap up from your side? Generative AI is like the invention of fire. It's a completely different world now. You can't think about the future the way you've thought about the present in the past. We're in a different world now. The economy's got to change. How we pay people, what, how we, where we find value, has to change fundamentally. Um, this is not disruptive technology. It's replacing technology. It's replacement. It's replacing all of us. All the things that we've six years it takes to become a dietitian. I can ask ChatGPT to give me a meal plan in seconds. It does better than any dietitian can do. Klarna fired 700 people one year ago. Today, the CEO says, I can have AI do the work of 700 people. That's a 700 to one change. There are going to be jobs for people in AI, but not for 8 billion people that are on the planet. So things have to be, we have to rethink things on a grander and more fundamental uh, scale. Thank you, Vinny, for that cheerful vision. <laughs> And Mike, uh, why don't you give us your final thoughts? Thanks, Costas. Um, yeah, you know, I think that I think this actually ties in pretty substantially with uh, with what with Vinny and and uh, Iman's uh, closing remarks too. Just you know, a quick reflection, Ramir. I'm really glad that you um, you know you brought up really the, the sort of uh, you know a labor market and a, a labor concern really to to close out this um, this discussion. You know, we had to keep our our meeting today pretty constrained. We didn't, you know, talk beyond sort of you know what we're thinking about in terms of training the next generation of workers. We didn't really talk about long term policy development, um, but it actually is it's inherently related. The workforces that we're training right now, the, the the people that we're educating right now, are going to be the people who end up leading policy development in the future, and they're going to have to grapple with issues not strictly constrained to technology, but but related as well to the experience, to the human experience, as we all live in a world where AI is present. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's a really, it's great that we're, you know, talking about just the, the writer strike. And I, I think the last thing I would, last remark I would make, we can, you know, of course, have another, you know, another series of meetings about what we do about, uh, you know, labor, work-life balance, uh, financial uh, sustainability, in a world where uh, AI is affecting jobs as much as it as it is and it will be, um, but just to I think to circle back to Ayad's second question, uh, which he you know which he I thought was fantastic, 
about academic integrity and the academic experience. Just a, a three things that I would mention on that point, because I think for me, as a, as somebody who's been a student really since the you know the beginning of the pandemic until now, with ChatGPT really changing the academic experience, that for me is the big that's the writer strike moment where everything is changing, everything is much much different. My three pieces of advice would be engage your students in projects, do the best you can to engage your students in projects. Second, it's a corollary. Recognize that your students are probably working and figure out if there are ways that you can get those projects connected to things that your students are doing in their work lives. And then third, and perhaps most importantly, this is, I guess, advice for academic leadership too, is really invest in your educators. Figure out how you can make them more engaging in the classroom, better lecturers, better speakers, um, because we've got, as students, we've got tons of opportunities to learn in other ways now. And you've got to, you've got to give that value proposition for, for us coming into a classroom and sitting, sitting and listening to a lecture. Sorry, Great. I had to hustle there. Great. Um, uh, I have to say this is a spectacular panel. Everybody applaud, put on icons. I'm going to turn it over to Stephen uh, with one reminder, and that is that we're not talking about a student who has to have, like in days of old, we had government classes and you know how to be a, a good citizen. Well, now we need how to be a digital citizen, and perhaps AI has a role to play there. Stephen, you, you can close us out. Okay, thank you, everyone. It was a great discussion. Uh, we, we'll be doing some follow-up. I'm going to turn this over back to Mike. He's the one who coordinates all the activities uh, in, for the webinar and can give you uh, some direction on where you can find the recording and whatnot. Mike, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, folks, I put a link in, uh, to the flyer for today's the talk I'm doing. If you're interested in hearing some more cheer. Thanks, Benny. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending today. Uh, all the links are going to be available. They're already available on the Insight membership page. I was going to try to share that so you guys could see where that's at. Um, here's what it looks like. Share. So if you hit that link, you go out to our membership page, hit the monthly membership you'll get to the March 15th date and the references are listed down here on the bottom. And I'll add more links as I go through the chat to make sure that everything's covered there. Uh, again, we appreciate you staying here. And um, I did put in a link for the, um, uh, for the survey. So please give us your feedback on that. And we're a couple minutes over, um, have a great weekend. And we'll see you next month, um, hopefully at our next membership meeting. Thanks, Take everyone. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye hey. now. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Great job, panel.